Thank you very much. I think for a start, what uh, highly motivates us in uh, working with SkyClean is that we do believe that we actually have to, over time, also deal with a negative emission part, uh, meaning the carbon capture. I think for the time being, we are all busy in reducing the emission of uh, CO2, uh, but we do believe that uh, a negative emission is needed. Uh, and that, of course, is also highly relevant for the agriculture, where we do have certain uh, biological processes in the agricultural which will uh, emit uh, gases and therefore we do believe that we need a negative element on that part. What we're working with at SkyClean is basically to use the plants. Uh, actually the good Lord created the plants as being the most efficient uh, creature on the planet to actually car capture carbon uh, from that, uh, from the atmosphere. We are working purely with waste products. Uh, we are putting the waste products into our pyrolysis. That gives us two things. It partly gives us fuel, uh, and it partly gives us uh, biochar. And the biochar we can keep for centuries, and the fuel, of course, we can use as green fuel. The beauty of this is that 50% uh, would actually be recycled, and thereby this actually has a positive spiral, meaning that the more we are using that, the more carbon capture we would actually have over time. And 50% of the carbon is segregated, and 50% is actually recycled as energy, uh, which can be used as, for instance, a green oil. We are working with uh, quite many feedstocks. Um, we are highly working with what we call dry feedstocks, what we call wet feedstocks. Uh, but uh, over the globe, we can use an, a number of elements. It's clear that we are also looking at the cost of feedstock, uh, and that the uh, fibers from the biogas is highly uh, attractive because they are relatively cheap, because they are already gathered at one location. From a uh, farmer viewpoint, um, the biochar uh, actually has a number of, of positive elements. Uh, I don't want to go through them all, uh, but due to the fact that we heat up uh, the fibers uh, to 600 degrees, uh, we do get a very, very clean product. Uh, so any kind of, of uh, medical, any kind of chemical will basically be decomposed in very, very small uh, hydrocarbon, and that will actually go into the gas content. Where are we now? Um, we actually early this year uh, inaugurated our first plant in uh, the Green Lab facility in Skive. And uh, this is actually uh, uh, producing heat uh, for the close by uh, biogas, also co located at Green Lab in, in Skive. And there we actually built a 2 megawatt uh, unit. Uh, a 2 megawatt unit would consume uh, 4,000 ton uh, dry matter per year. Uh, but as I will show you later on, we are actually looking at a 20 megawatt uh, plant, uh, which we started construction, and that will actually consume uh, 40,000 uh, ton dry matter per year, and that actually fits quite well with the common size of biogas plants nowadays. We do have a number of uh, downstream processes which we can do. We are starting with the very easy part, and that is basically to convert the pyrolysis gas to heat. Uh, this is uh, fairly simple, this is fairly cheap, uh, we don't need any refinement on that. The only condition is that we have the offtaker for the heat relatively close by, because uh, if the gas is cooling down, then it's condensating, and thereby we will get uh, oil. So uh, it needs to be a way where we can heat the gas on, until it goes into the burner. The next step, which we're working with, uh, and we have already produced the first oil, uh, that is actually to convert uh, the gas, condense it, and to make a bio-oil. Uh, and over time, we do believe that the liquid products would probably have a higher commercial value than the gas products. That's why we're looking at this. Uh, and finally, we are working with the slightly more complicated, uh, slightly more energy-consuming way, where we will basically end at methanol. And uh, we do believe that uh, 10 years down the line, green methanol would be one of the very, very high-valued resources. 
And the beauty is that we are working with a modular system. So if we start uh, just burning the gas as we would do uh, next year, then we can actually easily swap uh, in any of these configurations later on. So uh, whenever there is a higher demand, uh, more off-takers for uh, oil, then we can swap that. So that's what we're working with on our technology roadmap. What you see here is actually uh, the results from, uh, from last week. Uh, that's the plant in Skive, uh, where we are actually uh, pyrolyzing uh, biogas uh, waste fibers, and we are converting the heat back uh, to the biogas plant, and they are using that heat in order to upgrade the biogas to, to biomethane. So I think that's a very, very uh, excellent way uh, where uh, partly the biogas plant is getting more uh, greener, and we do have a, a good co-location. And over time, we do believe that uh, fiber will come from the biogas plant, and heat would come from the pyrolysis plant, and there would be a high uh, symbiotic effect on that. We are working a lot uh, to make sure that we have what we call a high-quality biochar, uh, and uh, luckily, there is quite a lot of regulations uh, within, partly within Denmark, uh, but partly within the EU, which basically stipulates uh, what kind of uh, content should you have in the uh, biochar. Um, it's, mostly, it's mostly the uh, PH8, uh, which is the, the cycle uh, car carbon contents, which can be potentially toxic. So there we are very pleased with the results we do, and what you see on, on the chart uh, here, is that we are actually uh, fairly, fairly much uh, below the threshold values. And that, of course, is extremely important, so we can make a biochar which can be spread out uh, in any soil. And it's also very important because we do see the biochar as an excellent carrier for the nutrients uh, from uh, any kind of uh, livestock residues. We have actually, uh, earlier on this year, uh, tested how to uh, spread the uh, biochar pellets. Um, we are using uh, pellets, uh, and the beauty is that uh, when we uh, pyrolyze the pellets, uh, we also get pellets out, and thereby we do have a product which is very handy. Uh, you do see that there is a slight dust uh, from the spreader, but actually very little, and it's not any worse compared to any kind of, of normal fertilizer which we are spreading. Uh, so when we were spreading this, uh, we were actually uh, spreading out uh, one ton per hectare. Uh, that would be equivalent to, uh, roughly speaking, 25 kilo uh, of phosphorus per hectare, and thereby this could actually substitute a, a normal phosphor fertilizer. So we do believe that uh, there would also be a business case in this going forward, partly because we can better uh, circulate the nutrients, uh, partly because uh, fertilizer has also increased uh, quite a lot uh, over the last um, few years. The next step we are working with is the so-called 20 megawatts uh, plant. Uh, and the 20 megawatts is basically a yardstick for uh, what is the heat uh, in the feedstock which we are using. Uh, and thereby we would be taking the 20 megawatt, we will create a 10 megawatt heat, and we will convert the rest of the 10 megawatt uh, energy into the biochar. What you see here is the plant which we have started in uh, Vrå. Uh, this is co-located with the biogas plant uh, BB Biogas uh, in the northern part of Denmark. And um, there we are uh, on the way of uh, this construction, where we are basically using the residues from the biogas, directly from the biogas plant, which goes into the pyrolysis plant. It works in the way that we are basically taking the wet fibers uh, from the uh, biogas plant, uh, that is uh, pressed so we get it with 30% uh, moisture, uh, moisture. Then we have a steam dryer, um, and this is very important because we would like to get the water out of the feedstock before we pyrolyze it. Then the pyrolysis process is much easier. And there we are actually using a steam dryer, so we are generating the heat from the pyrolyzed burner, 
We are using the steam from 180 to 140 degrees, and then we are actually using the 140 degrees heat uh, for the upgrade of the biogas plant. So that's where we have a very, very optimal energy uh, consume when we have a co-location with, with the biogas uh, plant. We then have the, the drying, uh, where we are drying down the uh, feedstock to 90% um, uh, dry matter. Uh, we do have a um, ammonia stripper, um, so uh, the rest of the ammonium uh, in the wet part is actually uh, separated as an ammonium uh, fertilizer. Then it goes into pelletation, and then it goes into the black box, uh, which is basically the pyrolysis oven. It is heated up to uh, 600 degrees for about 60 minutes, and then it basically comes out as uh, pure uh, biochar, which is uh, stable carbon, and then the nutrients, uh, phosphorus, uh, potassium, that is basically um, put as salts in, in that, and, and that is accessible for the plants, uh, so thereby we do get a fertilizer uh, from this process as well. And when we are looking into uh, how does this work sort of more on a diagram farm, um, for the particular plant, um, they are producing about uh, 800,000 ton of wet uh, fibers per year. That is converted into uh, 38,600 uh, dry matter uh, per year. We are then converting this into uh, 15,100 uh, 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 ton uh, biochar. Uh, this biochar actually have a high ash content, uh, which is mostly uh, phosphorus, and thereby this is a high value uh, biochar because it actually acts as, as a fertilizer. Uh, the smart thing is that the carbon capture effect is actually quite large because we are only capturing the carbon and thereby we get a multiplying factor. Um, so each ton of carbon would actually be equivalent to 3.6 ton uh, of CO2 equivalent. And um, if we have an S content uh, slightly lower, then roughly speaking, every ton of uh, biochar uh, would be equivalent to uh, capturing uh, two ton of, of CO2. In addition to the carbon capture element, the dark green one, uh, we do get additional benefits. Uh, that is mostly the green heat uh, we are generating from, from the process. So when using the biogas, we are basically taking a waste product of a waste product and getting energy out of that. And that energy is something the biogas bacteria culture cannot uh, re retain. And that's because the pyrolysis can actually uh, dissolve uh, some of the very uh, heavy chains uh, in the carbon uh, hydrogen molecules, and thereby they, we can basically extract energy out of that. From a business case viewpoint, um, this has been uh, highly exciting uh, over the last uh, two years. We started, of course, where the, the gas prices were very low. Um, for the plant we are looking at, uh, we do actually have a payback period of about six years. And that's actually with the assumptions we have here. We do believe that uh, we can get um, 750 kroner or around 100 euro uh, per ton um, CO2 uh, sequestration. Um, this is an unregulated market for the time being, uh, but there is a free market and many big companies is actually buying into these um, carbon capture certificate, but of course they need to be documented very well. We are counting on that the green heat uh, has a value of uh, 350 kroner or about 50 euro per megawatt hour. We do believe that's a decent price to count on for long-term uh, green energy. Of course, as we speak, uh, it is much higher, but we do uh, expect that that would um, uh, fall again. Um, we are, of course, putting a value in, into the feedstock, uh, but one of the benefits is that we also get a, a high-value uh, biochar out of it. The biochar we have actually put to zero value, uh, and we do see the biochar could also be an appetizer for instance, for the biogas plant to secure feedstock going forward, and thereby 
the farmers who are delivering uh, feedstock to the biogas can actually get biochar, including the fertilizer. We do also believe that the biochar is an efficient way to actually redistribute uh, mostly phosphorus. Uh, so if you are in an area where you have too much phosphor, you can basically get uh, all your uh, nitrogen uh, fertilizer back on the farm, and then you can uh, sell the phosphorus, and thereby you can actually have a better uh, uh, usage of, of that. So that's some of the elements which we have not really uh, taken into account in, in, into the business case. But the good, uh, the good news is that we do believe that this can actually work on free commercial conditions. We do not see any need for subsidize for bringing this forward. So to uh, round it up, uh, the biochar is extremely durable. Uh, we have the biochar certified, so we would have 87% uh, uh, stable uh, even after 100 years. So this is something which would give a, a very long-term uh, carbon capture element. As mentioned, the co-locations be between biogas and SkyClean is uh, really excellent. There is a high uh, symbiotic effect. Um, more or less all uh, biogas plants do need heat uh, in order to, to upgrade the, the, the biogas, and, and that's where, where we see this getting started. If the heat for upgrading the biogas would come from electricity over time, then we can produce oil again, and thereby this investment would not be, be wasted. We can redistribute the, the, the phosphorus, and then, of course, we also do believe that the pyrolysis gas is one of the ingredients in order to make sure that we can be more uh, self-contained with energy in the future, and at the end of the day, also get a more stable energy sequence. So that was a bit about the pyrolysis part. Extremely happy for questions. Let's start by giving Peter an applause. Thank Are you. there any uh, questions? Otherwise, I can uh, go first. Um, <laughs> all of it sounds great. What's the catch? The, the, the catch, of course, is exactly what we're doing uh, to demonstrate this works in full scale. And that's why we are putting a lot of effort in uh, building the plant in Vrå, the northern part of Denmark. Uh, we are crossing finger, uh, should be fully on the road by May next year. Uh, we have secured all the hardware. Uh, the building is on the way, uh, which will be ready by uh, the end of uh, the December. Um, so that, of course, would be the proof in the pudding that it actually works. We do get uh, the output uh, based on the input, etc. Okay. Any uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about one of the pictures that you shown on the slide about the black box and um, the steam heating. So if you look at the um, energy yeah. and emission. Did this one? So um, what happened now? Which one of them? Uh, if you go further. Further back. Uh, no. F um, yeah. I, uh, then I need to press the right one. I yeah, I don't know. Um, well, yeah, this, this one. one. Yes. yes. Hey, you have the reactor. You have the steam dryer. Uh, I can imagine that it's it's. Uh, you have to put a lot of um, energy in it and emission. So if you look at the heat and emission balance over there, like yes. how can you make that green? Yeah. The, um, the, this one basically works as an oven. Uh, and the pyrolysis process does not take any heat. So the only heat loss for this process is that we are putting cold feedstock in, and then we take warm feedstock out. So for the, um, for the black box, uh, that has got an energy requirement of about 70%, 7% we are losing for, for the heat loss. And this heat loss is basically uh, that we are cooling down uh, when we get the uh, pillars out, we need to cool them down uh, because otherwise they would burn in, in the atmosphere because there is oxygen present. Uh, the other element uh, is the, the trick here is to use the steam dryer and, and that is highly energy efficient because we are burning the pyrolysis gas so, so 
uh, we don't have any external sources, so we are burning the pyrolysis gas in this burner. Uh, we are heating up the steam to 180 degrees, using the steam dryer to cool it down to 140, and then this steam goes further to the biogas upgrade. So that's a very uh, high, uh, very efficient way uh, from an energy part. And, and that, of course, is extremely important when we are working with the wet feedstock. If we, um, if we will be working with a dry feedstock, for instance, straw, uh, then uh, this would not exist, and, and thereby this goes out of the equation. So dry feedstock is significantly easier to work with, but they are also more or less uh, somehow more expensive, because wet feedstock is a pure waste, wh where straw you can use for, for the elements. Did that answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Could you please put your slide back up that has the bullet points of the biochar benefits? It was maybe just the second or third slide very early in the presentation. Uh, right this there. one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'd just like to take a picture. Thank you. Okay, so they'll be taking. And and of course we are. Um, we, we are working uh, with uh, SEGIS, uh, who is the uh, Danish uh, Research Institute, um, and there we actually do have the biochar out uh, in the number of test sites for the time being uh, in order to, of course, verify that uh, we can get the value out of the fertilizer and that it also improves the fertility uh, of the soil. That is obviously something will take some years of testing in order to verify that. But I have to say that uh, pyrolysis is nothing new. Uh, it was actually used in South America uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, so, so it is basically um, old wines of new bottle on new bottles. What we're doing. I think the time has concluded. So uh, let's say another uh, big thank you for your presentation. Peter. Yes, you're welcome.